Please subscribe, like, and share. This has been uh, today. We will talk about it. Before I proceed, excuse my voice. It's kind of uh, off because I, I just had uh, I was sick for the last three days with the flu, and thank God it's not COVID, or I hope it's not. But my voice is coming back, so I haven't posted in over a week, and a lot of you are probably going, "Hey, what happened to him?" But anyway, today we will talk about four cylinder heads. And uh, what I have behind me here is the original 302 Ford E-type heads, or just like the 289 heads to the latest SC1 uh, Ford Motorsports. And we'll touch bases on these things and um, we'll see how it goes about. All right. So, uh, uh, I will share my experiences with all of them and I will not do any flow test on this thing. That's a rather um, moot point of this uh, juncture because of the fact that you can see all of them on the other videos where people compare so-so heads to that. And basically the bottom line is when you do compare cylinder heads, a lot of them are designed by professionals. And there's no going around the fact that if they are at the same port angle, just like this factory piece, the one with the bigger valve will usually flow the most air. So that's a moot point. I can throw it on a bench. If I see this got a 194 as opposed to stock 178, of course. Okay, so that's, uh, I will just talk about my suggestions, my, um, ex uh, well, experiences with them and my basic uh, should we say how I feel what would be the best application for any particular head okay so here we go we'll start with some serious discussion about Ford heads what I have here is an E7 head which comes in those HO 5.0 not much different than the th early 302 heads the same structure in the valves, I think it's a 178 <clears throat> intake valve, 145 exhaust. And then what we have here is a GT40 three bar. Okay, this is not the GT40P and I'll touch on that later on. I don't recommend the GT40P. I think it's an oddball, it should be avoided. Now, they look similar, same valve train layout, but it's got a bigger 184 valve and a 154 exhaust. Now, the two are significantly uh, different as far as performance. This has a very, very good exhaust. This is really well known as a real bad exhaust port, typical Ford at that time. And this Windsor head I have here, I don't know if it's visible, but anyway, it's a it's half a head that I took off of my uh, old race car and this was a spare one and it had a damage on one cylinder so I just cut it in half and keep it for posterity's sake. But anyway, what we have is that significant performance differences. You will not you well, you can port the dog pile out of this thing, big valves and everything, and this is a stock um, head with stock valves that E7 head or early 302 heads will lose to a GT40. In fact, the GT40 will also beat the old 351 Windsor head, but there are exceptions, and I'll point that out uh, in a little while here. And anyway. Um, as shown here, I match ported them to the um, Felpro 1262 gasket and same thing with the exhaust, 1415. And I'll do a quick turnaround here and uh, I'll show you that as well. Now, when you put 194 valves here and a 154 exhaust and change that over to a 160 Chevy, then you got a pretty darn good cylinder head. In fact, 
I have seen a lot of uh, GT40 with bigger intake valves and exhaust valves perform just as good as a lot of aluminum heads out there. Not the big 190, you know, 180 cc. You know, 180 cc uh, uh, aluminum head out there can get beat by this guy when it's properly prepared by a very competitive cylinder head guy. And if you know somebody out there and they do their magic on there, don't underestimate it. Like I showed in some of my videos, some of these guys are running fast. Come to think of it too, the cast iron has its uh, advantages on by itself as well over an aluminum as far as low compression engines are concerned. Anyway, I'm gonna turn this around and then we'll look at it from another perspective. Here's, here's a look at the intake port on a Thrifty on Windsor that I used on my race car from years ago. And here's a GT40. All right, you see these things here? It's amazing how they are very, very similar. All right, just excuse the dirt here. It's been sitting around a lot. Now, what I have done with the Thrifty One Windsor, which could be done with a GT40, was I press in a guide here and re drilled it and run an offset push rod. And this push rod restriction is cut, and you have a better line of sight straight to the valve. Okay, so. Um, when you do that, and I don't have that head anymore, somebody owns it, but it's out there floating around someplace, somebody's street race car, I remove this entirely by pushing in an aluminum um, bushing in there and redrilled for an offset push rod. And look how effective that thing is. And you can do the same thing here on the GT40 if you wanted to. You can also knock this thing down. But anyway, from the factory, this is not as bad. See that? But then it's been done up already here. You can still see it quite a bit. Over here, it's, it's not as obvious. Otherwise, they flowed the same with a little bit of an edge on a GT40. Okay? And when you put the big valves on bottom of them, that ratio does not change. Now we're looking at the business end of the uh, exhaust ports. And uh, from here on, what you're looking at is both of them are ported to the 1415 exhaust gasket. All right, from Frel Pro. And this has significantly more low, mid, and high lift flow than that. Okay, so. Um, again, uh, what we can do here is uh, take a close look and uh, I will do that right now and I will highlight what the differences are. Okay, so here we go. This is the Windsor Heads GT40 and the E7. These are matched to the Felpro 1415. All right, you can see it right there, match perfectly. That's the maximum I would suggest that everybody tries. Okay, and there's a very distinct difference here. This head will outperform this one due to the fact that this creates a very strong exhaust signal because of the port design as opposed to this one. So if you kept both of them stock valves due to the fact that this is a bigger intake valve and exhaust valve it'll outflow this but if you put chevy valves here and chevy valves there this will outperform this cylinder head because of this if you take a note closely look at the floor of this port it's flat we go transition to the gt40 and guess what? There's a bump there. Again, let's take a look at that. Bump, flat. You don't see the valve is as good. Now, 
a lot of people that are not really, should I say, informed about cylinder heads will take that and lock it down to make it look like this. Basically, that tells you they don't understand the concept of the short side radius on any part. Let me see if I can uh, open that up a little bit and maybe you can see in there. Oh, there we go. All right. At the same angle, you hardly see the valve there. It's not line of sight, and you can see it here. It's got a lot to do with low lift flow, and I will illustrate that on the whiteboard here in a few moments. Now, I would suggest uh, of going any larger than a 160, and I've done it on the Windsor Head 351, 1625, and I'll let you know what's the reason that I did that due to the fact that it doesn't have much short side from the factory so i had to try to get the largest valve as i can just to give me some kind of short side and there's and that's the reason and i'll illustrate that here on the next video shoot okay so uh there we are okay the two ports side by side i maxed this out Okay, the roof went through the guide and gave me that particular kind of ramp. All right, here I didn't go as much because this is a street car. Nevertheless, this still flows better than that, especially on a low mid lift. Now, be careful racing the roof on this because you have the EGR, okay, the air pump uh, port right there. For the smug pump and i'm a little bit lower on this side but if i would do this for racing i'll cut that off completely like i did here now from this angle you can see there's no short side and i have them both side to side like this right the short side is minimal and look at here it protrudes untrained or uh, somewhat ignorant headquarters will say that is no good. I've seen that happen. They knocked this sucker down because they want it to look like this. In the process, you created a lot of turbulence on the port floor of the exhaust. Here it prevents that. Okay, both of them is on the 1415 Felpro flange. This part I like is the is the it's flatter here. Whereas a GT40, they came down a little bit too low here. I don't like that one. I would have preferred it flat like this. But it's a, it's a minimum, uh, minimal concern, really. All right, so look at that. Looks impressive, but this functions better. Now we're looking at the Windsor 351. And if you look at, it's been milled big time where this is already disappearing <laughs> and you have ample here okay so that's an indication plus when you mail the 351 Windsor, the 351 logo that's here it says 351 it the number one disappears completely and this is only half a head so i can't really find an old one that it's been milled so much but one indication is here now when I talk about the short side radius, this has very little. This one here has a whole lot. If you look at that, and a lot of people, like I showed previously on, on the other part of this video, some people knocked this down and said, oh, that's no good. It, 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 it's not a, a free flow straight out, and this is better. Well, you don't have any short side radius there. So, in fact, this has shown a lot because I already put an oversized valve in there. Okay, so you see the point, the difference between the two. Ample, not enough. And the reason that I put a 1625 valve instead of a 1600 is that I wanted to go as far down as possible so that when I do the throat correction, it gives me some kind of short side. All right, so there you are. Now let's look at it another point. Okay, this is a cross-section of why the uh, GT40 head is superior to the Windsor 
351, E7, 289, 302 head, even if you port them, especially on the exhaust. And you know how the cross signal between overlap where the, where the signal of the very strong exhaust pull, especially low lift, towards the closing side of the overlap phase tends to yank on the now opening intake valve significantly. Now, where is my doggone pointer? It keeps disappearing. Oh, there it is. <laughs> now, here we go. What happens here? This is the 302, 351, E7 heads, early 302 style. Notice the short side. When the valve opens up at maximum lift or even low lift, it tends to do this and starts doing somersaults. The flow comes in and starts doing this. All right. When it does that, this is the effective port that you see. Turbulence. Now, when you understand the concept of the short side, you're putting something on the valve to have it something to back into like a support wall. Hence, this issue here. The GT40 has this raised part that I showed you earlier in the video when, you, when I put the camera here. You see this bump. Here, you don't see this bump. From this angle here, it looks impressive. So, wow, that's open. It should flow good. From here, wow, that bump is on the way. And, well, I shouldn't say ignorant, but um, uninformed headquarters We'll look at that and knock that down. Boom. Ruin a perfectly good head. Well, that sounded kind of nasty. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what happens here is that when the valve opens up, the flow comes in from here and here and of the other side. It tends to hug that short side wall and transition a little bit better. Okay? There's a problem 15 degrees of angle change will create turbulence, but this is more than 15 degrees. That's for sure, but it's better than nothing because here you're creating a, a funnel effect. Okay, you have these two sides here and has something to uh, follow path and create a less turbulent port flow. And like here, I bet you if you apply this technique here this way, and you're going to stabilize a lot of that turbulence that happens. It's not 15 degrees. It's less. Well, it's a lot more than 15 degrees, but it's better than nothing. This is critical because once the valve opens up and sees this area here, and sees that area is like a funnel. Okay, there's, a, there's no funnel here. You pull away too sharply. And... In essence, it kind of follows it a little bit, a little bit of turbulence, but not as bad because it's more than 15 degrees of angle change. Now, when I said I put a 162 valve size in it, this is another exaggeration, right? So what I did was when I put the bigger valve, it extended here and it extended here. Right? I cut straight here. So now the valve is oversized. Okay? And guess what I have here right now? A short side. Earlier, oh man, I'm at a horrible at drawing. So earlier it was like this, right? It was drastic. But since I put an oversized valve, now the change and you cut straight down you have a tiny bit and you just taper that off better than nothing all right better than the abrupt angle change here earlier when you go out this way by putting an oversized valve and that way you're creating a little funnel and there's a little bit of short side um, as a result of the angle change here you can put a bigger valve you already have the short side there's no use you don't gain anything anymore except added flow but the lowly flow numbers probably stay the same it's not significant enough to make quite a change but here on this layout 
like that before. It was ugly and abrupt. Really worse than that. You know, well, the valve was here, really. Like this. Okay. Now I went down here and I went up and here's what happened. There you go. Now you have some kind of short sight. Okay, guys. Part two. <laughs> anyway, uh, now we have the AFR and the Edelbrock. Which one do I like? Well, both of them are the same, but there is a big difference between the two. First off, especially for racing or running on the street with a healthy camshaft, we all know what valve spring issues are. When we look at here, this was running a metric small diameter metric valve size. This one's running 11 30 seconds. <clears throat> Typical small block Chevy Ford valve diameter. This one is metric, thinner, much lighter. You can get away with a lighter spring and you can save horsepower with that and not encounter valve float as readily as you would with any hydraulic uh, <clears throat> street camshaft. Now, both of them came with 716 studs, which is great. Valve springs are pretty much were the same on both. Intake port. Here you go. There's the, the Edelbrock and here's the AFR. The AFR is a little bit different as far as the, the gases are concerned. Uh, oh, there's not even a 1262. But uh, that is a little bit small, so it's a 1262. Yeah, I don't have the 12. I don't have 1262 is probably here someplace. But anyway, uh, the intake port flow out of them basically the same. If you're running the 170 or the 190 or whatever, uh, the difference there is just the intake valve. Uh, airflow is not everything. Do they keep? Um, the um, air and fuel mixture in a combustible homogeneous state when it dumps in the combustion chamber that's another story but from what I can see here both of them are pretty good spark plug locations are high enough I have concerns about this on nitrous maybe the Glidden Victor is not like that I have one there and I've I should have pulled it up here, but anyway, uh, anytime you have this, and that's also an issue with the twisted wedge R and the twisted wedge, the exposed uh, edge of the uh, spark plug boss here tend to crack. Here it's recessed, it won't do that, okay? So when you got a heavy nitrous oxide, boom, or supercharger, turbo, this would be a lot more durable. Now. Uh, that being said, there's a difference in the angle of the spark plugs and the exhaust port. Both of them very impressive. Okay. And uh, another plus here for the AFR is you have, you can plug this up and widen the uh, um, exhaust port. And that's what I run with <clears throat> the, uh, with Dan Degatas, uh uh, race car uh, we're making a lot of power won a bunch of races at different uh, uh, racing venues and uh, I also run this on the LAPD racing car or race car that's soon to debut out uh, it's at the paint shop right now but I like that exhaust sport better on the AFR than the Edelbrock Okay, so that's where we are. They got both of them got stiff uh, support here on the bottom of the block where we back in the early days we were having problems sealing this side of the um, uh, cylinder head. But right now, if I would choose, I'd take the AFR. 
because of the valve weight, the better exhaust port from the factory. Okay, you, you could also drill that. They gave you enough space there and plug this and cut it to be half, half of the uh, uh, cylinder head, just like here in this picture. It's an AFR and I plug this section up. Here it is, check it out. Now, since there's the point that I showed uh, also here on the AFR, and I can do that here with the Edelbrock, I cut this rail off, and then I put a plate, and I kick him up. And here it is, another picture of that. And here it is, another picture of that. Race port AFR. Now I gain about 35 CFM, 30 CFM for the same valve size. And every time you gain uh, CFM without overtly making the port bigger, uh, you gain torque and you gain horsepower. And that's what you're looking at. So uh, there it is. If I would look at this too, I'll take this for the street and some racing. But when you're looking at the Glidden Victor, oh, that's a wholly different story. All right, that's a step up. That comes close to the uh, a high port and the twisted wedge R. So there we are, guys. Okay, we have three types of TFS heads here. And uh, this is the first generation. It's a new casting, the TFS high port. And this is the twisted wedge. Excuse the dirt, it's been sitting around a while. And this is the TFS twisted wedge R, which is the radical version of that. But this one here, when it first came out, was a game changer for a lot of the 5.0 guys. And during our race with, um, the Grand Nationals, which kick-started the 5.0 revolution, uh, and I was with Kaufman Products, and later on, Storm and Norman, uh, I ran the high ports, and they are very impressive. They come in from the factory small, but you can really open them up, okay? The valves come in, I think 194 is the smallest one, and, and I've put in 218 out of them, okay? So... And this one here came with a 210, and I think this one came with a 212 or bigger. I ran them all the way to 216. Now, what are the differences? Well, like I said, out of the high port came the twisted wedge jars, and here's some pictures that uh, I've been working with uh, with Storm and Norman years ago. They're kind of grainy, old, but here they are. Check them out. We're going to be looking at is the P38 head by John Koss and uh, it's an impressive canted valve aftermarket head. The last canted valve made for this small block fours is of the Cleveland, the Boss 302 and the 351 Clevelands. 
every, just about every aftermarket head out there is in line, except maybe for the twisted wedge, but it's not a canted valve, and I will show it to you here. Uh, I will put uh, uh, TFS twisted wedge beside the P38, and the P38 is an impressive piece, and it's by Kasi, and valve sizes are excellent, and I will show you guys the, the difference between the, from the outset, it looks like it's very similar to a twisted wedge, but it's vastly different. As far as the geometry is concerned, it's got a different valve cover layout, but I think it could fit a standard uh, uh, Windsor valve cover. But here it is. From a quick look, it looks similar to a twisted wedge head, but it's not. It's far from it. Now, it is basically stock height low port approach it's not a high port like the yates and the exhaust is also basically at stock height maybe slightly taller but one thing with this is they they have their own special valve cover um, flange here it looks like it can take a uh, same valve cover regular Windsor style but I don't know about this part here I have to check and put on a Ford valve cover a regular Ford Motorsports but one thing you're gonna notice is that it is or it looks very similar to a twisted wedge but when you open the valve this canted the reason you're gonna notice it's canted is that when you open the exhaust and you open the intake, they collide. You won't see that with a twisted wedge or a regular Windsor. Okay? See right there? It hits. So, there is um, a cat design like the, uh, the 351 Cleveland heads or the Boss 302. Very similar. Now, when we look at a twisted wedge, <coughs> reason you're going to notice it's canted is that when you open the exhaust and you open the intake, they collide. You won't see that with a twisted wedge or a regular Windsor. Okay? See right there? It hits. So, there is um, a cat design like the, uh, the 351 Cleveland heads or the Boss 302. Very similar. Now, when we look at a twisted wedge, <coughs> A little bit rounded off, twisted wedge a little bit more closer over here on the on the combustion chamber side. And but from the outset when you look, oh okay, because it has well, I mean this is all taken apart. But you can tell the layout of the studs, but when you look closely, these two are spread apart. Which with the twisted wedge, it's all straight up. That signifies a uh, a canted valve arrangement. There you go. Very similar. Okay. Okay. I made the statement earlier why I favor the twisted wedge head over the others, as far as street is concerned. Street performance are partially into racing. Why I elected and favored the TFS twisted wedge. Now, there's nothing wrong with the other ones, they're just as great. They can flow equal amounts close to each other. It just comes down to what kind of uh, fuel and air is dispensed into the combustion chamber. Is it very homogeneous or is it clumps of, of vortex around the spark plug or around this area here? There are many, many issues. It's just not strictly airflow. It's actually what happens inside the combustion chamber when that valve finally starts to close and the piston starts to come up. And uh, on compression, what is the state of the fuel inside the combustion chamber? We know for a fact that the Yates is very, very superior in that regard. They've done countless research uh, Robert Yates Racing, Jack Roush, everybody else, you know, Penske, 
uh, very, very successful. And all the wedding issues with conventional heads around the spark plug, you know, and later on I'll explain why the intake valve uh, melts. I mean, not the intake valve, but the, the piston relief for the intake valve melts and some of the exhaust being hotter does not. You know, let's touch on that subject real quick. It's just because you have a lot of vortices right around this area here. When the fuel air comes in, they turn this way and they all get jammed. All the rich mixture gets jammed in this indentation here and over here. A lot of the rich fuel mix, fuel molecules are hanging around the vicinity of the spark plug. And right about here too. That's why sometimes they angle that and try to take all that vortex out of there and get all that rich molecules spread out even uh, evenly across the chamber. They try and uh, a lot of that vortex is formed right here too. And it's like I said earlier in the other video, it's very lean here and that's why it burns. It's not gonna burn there if it's rich. It cools it down actually even though it's a hot exhaust valve. No. Anyway, it's just a side issue. Okay, here we are. So we have the Edelbrock, the AFR, the Trick Flow, inline high port, twist wedge, and the Yates. We all know without a doubt that it's a superior cylinder head out of all these. Now, let's just not think of this as a as a race head. Let's just say it's a street head. Okay? When you look at here, inline, 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 twisted wedge, guess who gets close to the Yates? The twisted wedge. Do you guys see it from this angle on the camera? Right? It, it's, it went from here, it did this. That's what it did here. Okay? You can see that this is superior in that regard. Now, why did I build that 600 horsepower road racing engine with an AFR? Simple. The AFR has the metric valve. Thinner step. In line. It'll take the RPM and the punishment more than you would with a twist wedge. Okay? So, if I'm going road racing, this is the guy. On the street, this is the guy. High port, high RPM. So, Edelbrocks are good, the Glidden Victors, all that, excellent. Combustion chamber is the same. But I have one concern. I'm not harping on the TFS Twisted Wedge uh, like it's the best all, because it has problems, okay? And let me bring this camera closer so I can pinpoint that. Now we're looking at the hands, all of them lined up, okay? When you look at the Edelbrocks, you see the, okay, we have the heads all together here. When you look at the Edelbrocks, you can see that this part of the spark plug is exposed. You can have a little cracking happening right there under severe use. Nitrous, lots of boost, whatever. Okay? Now, the AFR is recessed down. It's hidden from the heat and all the master blaster stuff going on in there. Okay? So, that is secure and it's designed. You're not going to have much cracking. Same thing with the high port. Okay? Let me focus that better. It's not as bad. Now, here's the biggest downfall of the twisted wedge TFS. See that? Right here, it starts to crack straight across. Why is that? When I go at this angle, now you see it. There's not much meat there. It gets awfully hot and it starts to crack. Big, big problem. Not enough to junk the head, because once I open them up and go through the maintenance, I see cracks there. And I just touch it up with some welding and clean it up 
is good to go again. You don't have that issue with the with the Yates because the doggone spark plugs buried in there, except the tip showing, saying peekaboo, hello, here I am. This guy here is sunbathing in the combustion chamber. <laughs> you see it? And same angle here with the high port, not as bad, still. It's it's shallow enough or deep enough in there. And the AFR. But the Edelbrock has a similar issue as the deal, but not as bad. When you look at that, okay, that angle. Okay, compare that to this. Now you see my point. And every time I have that welded, I just run a, a spark plug chaser there and good to go again. All right, guys. Okay, now we go with the big boys. Well, some of the big boys. We don't have the billet CFEs and MBEs or whatever uh, kind of heads, but we've got more of the uh, what's on mass production out there. Now, back in 91, when uh, I was uh, approached by uh, TFS, uh, then run by uh, Ricky or Rick Smith uh, to run his pro stock heads in my uh, NA. Uh, car, the only one in the field of uh, five was to run normally aspirated, and this was the rage of the Buick versus the Grand Nationals. It was really hot and heavy going in there, and we we did a a race right after the SEMA show. Uh, SEMA show went on for several days, and at night everybody went to the racetrack at uh, the speedway there because uh, that's when the Grand National and the Mustang is duking it out, and so the um, that was the age of the new muscle cars, uh, the 1980s, 1990s muscle car wars. It was the Mustang 50 Fox Body versus the Grand Nationals. Anyway, so here we are. Uh, I declined because uh, he was making at least, I think, less than five or six sets. And I was afraid that if I did do that and put all my time and effort and then somehow one of the heads were damaged, uh, I couldn't get a replacement. And my mentor then, Charles Stevens, said, you know what, let's go with a, with a Yates combination. But, so, I ordered a Yates cylinder head, and then when it got back to me, surprise, surprise, it looks like this. <laughs> right here there are no guides there are no ports no things for this for the main studs for the valve train that's the intake port they give you tiny probably uh what i mean inch and a half by inch and a half <laughs> so there we are and then there's the combustion chamber there are no seats. You gotta configure how big a seat you want, how big a valve you think you should start with. All these are big question marks. There are no chambers. You gotta configure your own chamber. Now, when I called up uh, Robert Yates Racing then, and they go, "Well, it's 1990. Guess what? Let us know what you find." <laughs> they have a lot of information on the on a super speedway engine but drag racing was still new in fact i think i was one of the first ones on the west coast to run this combination and here's the exhaust port just as bad <laughs> there's nothing so um when i did this it took me a solid two months 45 days a week because what you have to do is you make I did one in the middle and did my configuration. I didn't even use the flow bench because the flow bench will tell me go bigger and bigger and bigger. Soon enough, it's going to be too big. And when you go after that rat race, you're going to sell yourself short. So I just looked at what I feel at that time, and I didn't know as much as I know today, uh, gladly. I learned from my mistakes. Uh, 
that uh, I looked at the parts that okay I like the short side radius I like the way the the roof goes in I put it together made my own chamber made a template and did my chamber and I liked it of all things at that time to go with a 210 intake valve and a 165 exhaust wrong move I should have sent for a 160 but I didn't know at that time so at a 210 instead now I should have went to a 216 214 or something like that no uh, that said I did all the exhaust same thing did one pattern it to the other three and do the other four and it took me two long months before I was done with it now when I took it out there at the track it was a big question mark and the car went 938 at 149 very fast so I'm going okay time to take it back pull the heads and flow test it lo and behold it's 283 CFM only and the car went 930 and the car was not light somewhere around 2900 I don't know I don't even have a, a K frame in there I got a stock uh, front K frame anyway what that taught me was the uh, validity and the importance of a combustion chamber the combustion chamber that I ended up with was 40 43 40 cc roughly something like that I think I settled down to 40 I mailed it made sure that they're all the same 40 cc and at that time I had this big question mark and I had a friend that I used to go to a lot of advanced engineering conferences who has the patent for the swirl and tumble meter and I told him my findings and he goes Ben is a combustion chamber uh, and we talked about it and he was correct well he know he designed his own flow bench as well and having the patent for the swirl and tumble meter he knows what he's talking about and I showed him my combustion chamber configuration he goes wow that's good anyway uh, with all that being said what I found out was that even though it flowed 283 it had the capability of producing power as much as a conventional head at that time Ford or Chevy or Mopar of a head that flows between 340 to 360 so let's just say round off to 350 CFM at 28 that small 280 CFM head made that much power if you look at 283 CFM that's pretty much what a standard dart or uh, inline anything Ford Chevy or Mopar would produce with a good porter I wasn't even I didn't even hit the 300 mark but the car made 800 horsepower impressive all because the combustion chamber being compact the heat doesn't get dissipated all around the big combustion chamber more of it's contained in a small volume to push the piston down so the thermally efficient design uh, it doesn't lose too much heat uh, and thereby uh, lose power in the process so uh, there we are I'll, I'll expound on that more about my experience it was pretty interesting so here we are now this is the C3L first generation V8 like the one I, uh, I did it's not this particular one here C3H this this is for a customer and this is uh, the SC1 and that's the Brodix which is similar to a uh, Blue Thunder in a way all right it's got a more straighter intake port than the 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 Blue Thunder has got a little twist it is more canted valve this is not as much these are basically uh, seven and a half uh, cat uh, or intake valve angle I don't recall what the the thing is the, the SC1 was fairly straight and flows good because of this reason so everything here this two valve train will not interchange with each other totally different now this one here you have to figure out where you're gonna put your guide plate and thread them if you make a mistake there you're done 
Okay. When you start welding, you start to twist everything and you're going to be chasing your tail. So what I did then was close to miraculous considering nobody was guiding me. Who knows anything about Yates in 1990 around our area? If I was a big shot uh, NASCAR guy, of course, I'd probably get a lot of help. All right. So anyway, I'm wearing a sweater right now, not my shirt because it's very cold out here. And I've been sick the last three days, like I said earlier. Now here's the intake port on the SC1 and the Brolix. Look how tall the SC1 is. This is tall at that time and required a different intake manifold. But look at this now. It's very high. And then Brodix came up eventually very similar to the Blue Thunder but it has a more straighter shot to the intake valve whereas the, the Blue Thunder turned. It turned in the, and uh, I got pictures of it uh, and check it out. Uh, where I compare this to the Blue Thunder and uh, the Brodix and here it is. It's not the same. Externally, they may all look like, but the Brodix, since it's a straighter path to the intake valve, flowed this one here about two, I mean, 435. Now, the Blue Thunder, I got as high as 425, 420, you know, uh, basically with a plate that I kicked up, just like that with a picture show. Now the SC1 is uh, significantly taller. It's got an approach to the back of the valve. If you talk about line of sight, you can see almost the, the whole intake valve. And here it's not as much. So this one I got to flow the best with a good size port. Not big, not small, a good size. It all depends on what the cubic inch of RPM you're going to turn. 380 CFM. Okay. I see some people out there say, oh, we made 410, 420, you know, 410, I go, wow. Well, at that point, I guess, you've carved it big enough that it's definitely going to flow. It doesn't mean it's going to function correctly. The airspeed coming in might be too slow, it might be uh, lazy, the response might be horrible, and you might have fuel and air separation or fuel drop off with that big uh, configuration. If you look at these ports, are really that big. Now. This one's a high port angle. Combustion chamber is the same. Basically the same. Okay. C3, SC1, you can hardly tell the difference. Alright? It's got more of these because it's got a bigger intake valve. You can fit a 226 if you really wanted to. But a lot of people are 222, 219, 218 or 220 whatever it's up to you exhaust valve I did 165 in my first generation C3 bad mistake I should have settled for 160 this one's here 154 imagine that this one here 160 220 intake valve huge Okay, when you look at this too, 40 cc, roughly 40 cc, 52 cc, big. So everything being equal, this too will outburst power that. Because the effectiveness of the combustion chamber is so much better with the, the Yates. C3, SC1, C3H, or the, the high port, they are all superior. Slight changes in the and the valve cap or hardly anything now uh, again you can see the straight approach here when you look at the the blue thunder it's got a curve okay because the valve is canted like the cleveland and basically the um, uh, blue thunder head is a up 
Well, it's a modernized Cleveland head. It uh, a, a better intake port, exhaust port's excellent, and um, two. I'll tell you a story about that after this. Uh, basically, what you're going to end up with is a. Uh, if you raise the Brodix and the Blue Thunder, whew, it'll be close. But this is superior. But the C3 is not going to be this, okay? Because it's got so much capability to flow air. With a decent combustion chamber, this is somewhat limited. This has the ultimate capability for power. Now, exhaust. Look at this. Let's get the highest exhaust port, high exhaust port, lower exhaust port. Now, why is this somewhat squared off and that's round? And that's somewhat round. Now, when, when you have an ideal port, the best one is has no valve, no turns or no bends, and you can keep it round. If you have a square port, you have dead zones on the four corners, okay? You have dead, dead zone here, dead zone, dead zone, dead zone. Uh, not good for flow. Now, when it's almost standing straight up, what it does is you can keep it oval or round going out the exit like it shows here on the SC1. This one here is squared up because it doesn't go high, it turns down lower. When the, the port turns from the valve pocket, they, they turn, you got to widen the sides. So when you widen the sides, you can't automatically bring them back. So where it turns, you want to slow it down a bit so you widen the sides so that it has the ability to take that short turn radius and not create any turbulence on the floor. So you end up with this configuration. A squared up configuration out of necessity that's what it dictates now if I were to round it this off with uh, with a lower port it's not gonna function correctly unlike this one or this one this one is a wider uh, port besides that okay because this was supposed to be a lot bigger cubic inches therefore more exhaust flow so forth and so on there's more high rpm uh, a 400 incher under 410 this is up to 454 <laughs> that's why you look at that doggone exhaust port you know not only is it round but they kick the sides as well to give it more space more expansion space to to flow more so there we are um, now on the blue thunder typical Ford racer like me I was schooled in the bad Ford exhaust ports, horrible, especially the ones in the Clevelands and Boss 302s. 460 has got the same thing. But here's what happened. When I first did uh, a Blue Thunder head before for Huey DeWitt, and again, I did not go to the flow bench. I ran it the way it is, made my passes, pulled the heads off and see what I have. I'm not the only one that does that. Bob Glidden does the same thing. He looks at the shape of the port, the way he likes it. He has the eye for it. Hopefully I have the same, but I don't know if we're looking at the same thing. Maybe perhaps different, but to come up with, with the same conclusion or different, who knows? But anyway, he does uh, his porting and then run it, dyno it, and then look at what he has the flow bits and the dyno numbers not the other way around and I follow the same thing because the guy is my hero and uh, I admire him for his talent doing everything in-house on his own now when I did the heads for Huey um, we uh, ran and looked at the numbers and I took it not to my flow bench no 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 I took it by flow bench I couldn't believe my numbers that small block head flow 300 CFM at 900 lift. Wow, 300 CFM. That is huge. And I have a normally aspirated engine. I was drawing too much. 
Now, <laughs> I went to another shop. In fact, a Mopar guy with uh, uh, floor beds that I knew was accurate. And I gave it to him and they called me up because you won't believe what I what I found on your hands. I go, how much are you looking at? He goes, 300 CFM, right on the money. I go, that's exactly what I got. And he started going, holy cow, is this for a supercharger or turbo? I said, no, it's in there. Oh. So anyway, I called Huey and Irwin and uh, we swapped rocker arms. We took his exhaust and the others they didn't take, they swapped. So both of them ended up with a 1.7 rocker on the exhaust because it was way too much flow. It was drawing the, the column charge instead of to the combustion chamber out the exhaust. And really the efficiency took a dive. So anyway, with both of them changing the rockers uh, on the exhaust to a smaller uh, rocker ratio and lost about 80 thousands lift, big time. Uh, they gained power. Picked up 60 foot, mid-range, top end, no losses with a smaller exhaust uh, duration and lift. No, no, the duration is the same, but the lift uh, got cut down about 70,000, big, big time. Anyway, so that's where we're at with this thing. Uh, again, um, let's look at this. The valve train is totally different. They require Jessa or TND. And uh, from the outside, you can hardly tell. They're all high port exhaust. Okay, and there's no cat. The push rails go straight up, right angles. If there is just a tad bit on the SC1, more on the Brodix, even more so with the canted valve uh, uh, Blue Thunder. It's like I said, it's like a Cleveland, updated Cleveland. And there you're gonna have issues of, of geometry and, and you're pushing sideways on the push rod. Uh, it doesn't like it too well, high RPM. Anyway, if I would say, where are you gonna build here for ultimate SC1? High RPM or big cubic inch high RPM, SC1. This one here is not really that much capable. It's better than most. It'll outdo almost all inline heads except the Pro King. All right, but um, I think uh, if you build a 440 high RPM, I uh, know. I think this one probably be better off with a 415, 410 cubic inch, big bore, short stroke. This one, whatever your party is, is ready to come in. <laughs> and this one here, lots of RPM and also big cubic inch. You don't want to put this on a 302. Here, if you keep the port small, sure, you can do it. All right, so there we are, guys. Please subscribe, like, and share.